Well, this message is uh, <coughs> one that uh, kind of came to me last night as we were driving back from uh, my daughter's uh, house in Arlington. And uh, I started pondering the uh, passage found in Matthew 22, verse 14. But in order to talk about 22:14, you have to kind of see the story in context. And my message is called "The Call of God." And this is an often misunderstood passage that I think it's important as we are talking about the kingdom and what we are in the kingdom, it's important for us to understand. Because uh, many people, they go into the ministry and they say, well, God's called me. Uh, and they'll quote this scripture, many are called, but few are chosen. Well, God's chosen me to, to go into the ministry. And I think we need to understand what it means to be called and what it means to be chosen. But our text is in Matthew 22, 1 through 14. And Jesus is speaking to this group of Pharisees who were busy trying to uh, attack him and find a way to kill him. And it says, And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by a parable. And he said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen, my fatlings are killed, and all things are made ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, they went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. The remnant of them took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king had heard thereof, he was wroth. And he sent forth his armies to destroy those murderers and burned up their city. And then he said to his servants, The highways... The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find bid to the marriage. So the servants went out, and the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw that there was a man which was not on, didn't have a wedding garment on. And he said to him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And the man was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. And it seems rather straightforward. Nice story talking about a wedding and the king who's inviting guests to a wedding. And the church normally says, well, this is the wedding feast of God and uh, says, you know, these people were not good people to have here, so we're just going to go out and invite everybody into the wedding both good and bad, and they're going to be here. But three questions at the very least have to be asked about this particular passage in order to understand it. Number one, what does the final verse mean? For many are called, but few are chosen. Who does this apply to? Who is it that are the many, and who is it that's chosen? And for what? 
What is the purpose? And the third thing we have to ask ourselves is why is this important for us to understand as believers? Why do we need to know who's called and who's chosen? And to answer that, we've got to understand that this cannot mean that God pulls both unrighteous and righteous into His wedding feast. It's not going to happen. If it was going to happen that way, there would have been no need for Jesus to come and die. Correct? Right. Okay? Because we know that fact. We cannot interpret that the servants just went out and gathered righteous and unrighteous out of the pastures, out of the field, out of the highways and byways and brought them into the wedding feast. God is not going to allow this to happen because it explains it to us that here's a man who arrives with no wedding clothes on. And what is the wedding clothes? TJ, what is uh, of the wedding clothes symbolic of? Well, it would be the believing in Christ and accepting Him. Yeah, but it, specifically the robes of what? Righteousness. So that there's a term that we normally see that it's called the robes of righteousness. He did not have robes of righteousness on, therefore he was unrighteous. And somehow he had tried to sneak in to this wedding feast. The king says what? Friend, what are you doing here? You don't appear to me to be what? Worthy to come to this wedding feast. Why? You were not righteous. Your robe gave you away. The fact that you did not have on a robe of righteousness is easy for the king to see that you don't belong here. Okay? Now then, this passage specifically is a commentary on two particular things. And one is a passage out of Ecclesiastes. And it's kind of strange. Ecclesiastes is... Uh, a book that Jesus quotes from a lot. There's a lot of little tidbits in all of his discourses that Jesus pulls from Ecclesiastes because it talks about human interaction a lot in Ecclesiastes. How do people treat other people? How does God treat other people? But specifically, this is out of Ecclesiastes 8, 4 through 17. So let's look at Ecclesiastes here. For the word of a king is authority and power. And who can say to him, what are you doing? It's pretty good. Who has that ability to question a king? says, whoever observes the king's command will experience no harm, and a wise man's mind will know both when and what to do. For every purpose and matter has its right time and judgment. Although the misery and wickedness of man lies heavily upon him who rebels against the king, for he does not know what is to be, for who can tell him how and when it will be? 
There is no man who has power over the Spirit to retain the life, the breath of life, neither has he the power over the day of his death. There is no discharge in battle against death, neither will sickness or wickedness deliver those who are its possessors and given to it. All this have I seen while applying my mind to every work that is done under the sun. There is a time in which one man has power over another to his own hurt or to the other man's hurt. And so I saw the wicked buried, those who had come and gone out of the holy place, but did not thereby escape their doom. And they are praised and forgotten in the city where they had done such things. This also is vanity, futility. Because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, the hearts of the sons of men are fully set to do evil. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times, and his days seemingly are prolonged in his wickedness, Yet surely I know that it will be well with those who reverently fear God, who revere and worship Him, realizing His continual presence. But it will not be well with the wicked, neither will he prolong his days like a shadow, because he does not reverently fear and worship God. Here also is a futility that goes on upon the earth. There are righteous men who fare as though they were wicked, and wicked men who fare as though they were righteous. And I say this also is futility. Then I commended enjoyment, because a man has no better thing under the sun without God than to eat and drink and be joyful. For that will remain with him in his toil through the days of his life which God gives him under the sun. When I applied my mind to know wisdom and to see the business activity and the painful effort that takes place upon the earth, how neither day nor night some men's eyes sleep, then I saw all the work of God, that man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun, because however much a man may toil in seeking, yet he will not find it out. Yes, more than that, though a wise man thinks and claims he knows, yet will he not be able to find out. Now then, this passage is long. But this is the passage that Jesus is throwing back at these Pharisees. Specifically, where he says, verse 13, But it will not be well with the wicked, neither will he prolong his days. Okay? Okay? And then even twelve, though a sinner does evil a hundred times, his days are seemingly prolonged in his wickedness. Yet surely I know that it will be well with those who reverently fear God, who revere and worship Him, realizing His continual presence. These things are talking about the difference between men who are evil and men who are good. We see that the evil men will not come to good. But sometimes good men suffer evil. The second thing we have to look at is a passage. And it comes out of the, the Babylonian Talmud. And this book was compiled about 500 A.D. But it has 500 600, 700 more years of material in it that was finally compiled. It's all this rabbinic commentary on the Old Testament. All these questions and answers over problems in life. Many times Jesus quotes 
he didn't quote from it, but he'll say something that we only find later, 500 years later, being written down in the Talmud. And in order to sometimes understand what Jesus is saying, we've got to look back in these books because this is what the Jews were talking about in his day. We find an interesting story in this uh, tractate Berachot, and there's a discussion on the righteous and wicked, and this is found in Folio 7a. And this is where we finally see this concept gel of why it's important to know who's called and who's chosen. It says, Rabbi uh, Jonathan, jo Yohanan, further said in the name of Rabbi Yose, three things did Moses ask of the Holy One, blessed be he, and they were granted to him. He asked that the divine presence should rest upon Israel, and it was granted to him. For it is said, Is it not in that thou goest with us, so that we are distinguished, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth? Moses asked that the divine presence should not rest upon the idolaters, and it was granted to them. For it says, so that we are distinguished, I and thy people. He's, he's saying that Moses asked that God's presence would be upon the children of Israel so that they were distinguished as good people versus the idolaters. Moses asked that God would show him the ways of the Holy One, blessed be He, and it was granted to Moses. God showed him these ways. For it is said, Show me now thy ways. Moses said before him, Lord of the universe, why is it that some righteous men prosper and others are in adversity? Some wicked men prosper, and others are in adversity. And God replied to him, Moses, the righteous man who prospers, is the righteous man, the son of a righteous man. The righteous man who is in adversity is a righteous man, the son of a wicked man. And the wicked man who prospers is the wicked man, son of a righteous man. And the wicked man who is in adversity is the wicked man, son of a wicked man. Okay? You have to understand Jewish teachings. It's a little on the convoluted side to us Americans. But what they're saying is because you have the passage in Deuteronomy the sins of the Father and the blessings of the Father. And so they have, to, they have to comment and merge all of these passages so that they all make sense. Because you can't have something contradict something else in the Old Testament. So that's why sometimes these comments are rather obscure to us because we don't understand that they're kind of weaving this all throughout this whole passage. But it is said, the Master said above, the righteous man who prospers is a righteous man, son of a righteous man. The righteous man who is in adversity is a righteous man, son of a wicked man. But this is not so. For lo, one verse says, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children. The other verse says, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. And this contradiction was pointed out in these verses. And the answer was given that there is no contradiction here. The one verse deals with children who continue in the same course as their fathers, and the other verse with children who do not continue in the course of their fathers. 
So you must therefore say that the Lord said to the Moses, A righteous man who prospers is a perfectly righteous man. The righteous man who is in adversity is not a perfectly righteous man. The wicked man who prospers is not a perfectly wicked man. And the wicked man who is in adversity is a perfectly wicked man. Now, we have to understand that the real answer to our passage, who is called and who is chosen, it lies within these Jewish writings and commentaries. And specifically, Ecclesiastes in the Jews wanted to know this answer to the question. Why is it a righteous man who fares well? And why is there a righteous man who fears badly? Okay? So, when you look at the term in the text that we read in Matthew, it says they went into the highways and the byways and pulled everyone in, both the good and the bad. Now do you have a little better sense of who the good and the bad are? It's not the wicked that's being pulled in, but those righteous who were obviously righteous and those righteous who were faring badly. And this is what I'm trying to explain to you, is that we're all righteous here. Some of us are faring badly in life. We're suffering adversity. Many people who are following God around the world are suffering adversity. Does this mean that God is not with them? No. They're all going to be called and chosen at the wedding ceremony. All men on the face of the earth are called to the wedding of the Lamb. Everybody. Amen. But few are chosen because only a few want to wear the robes of righteousness. <coughs> if a man does not wear that robe of righteousness, the king is going to say, bind him hand and foot and get rid of him. Take him into the darkness. He does not belong here. This is the answer to our question. Who is it that's called and who is chosen? I've told you guys on and for the last year about the kingdom of God that's here on the earth. In order to be a part of Jesus' kingdom on the, the, the earth, we have to put on the robes of righteousness. Be born again. That's what Jesus kept saying. You've got to be born from the Spirit. Because the Spirit is what imparts that robe of righteousness to us. Born of the flesh doesn't mean anything. Everybody's born of the flesh and we go right back into the dirt. It's not rocket science. At some point, we will all be worm fodder. Unless we don't taste good to a certain worm, and then he leaves us alone. But only by accepting Jesus as our Messiah can we put on the robe of righteousness and be a part of Jesus' kingdom here on the earth. There's many people that don't understand 
what it means to be chosen. There's a lot of people that think it is God's chosen. He's elect. It's 144,000 that He's chosen. No! has nothing to do with that. That's a whole made-up theology that just needs to be flushed down the toilet. It is wrong. God has called all men, every last man, woman, and child that has ever been born upon the face of the earth has been called by God to be righteous. But how many have been chosen by God because they have accepted to wear a robe of righteousness Righteousness to come before the King. We must put on that robe of righteousness so that we can walk in power and authority with the signet ring that God has given to us as joint heirs with Him through Christ Jesus. If we won't do that, we have refused to come to the wedding feast that's prepared. It's that simple. If we want to walk in the kingdom which Jesus has prepared for us and receive the blessings that He has prepared for us and laid out before us, and feast at His table of blessings. We have to prepare ourselves by putting on that robe of righteousness. How do we do that? How do we prepare ourselves by putting on a robe of righteousness? Well, we first have to accept what? Hello, come to the wedding feast! Hello, come to the wedding feast. We are called. We have to accept that calling which all men are called. Repent. Repent and come put on a robe of righteousness and be prepared to come to the feast. We have to Accept the call of repentance. We have to make a change. What's the next thing that we have to do? We have to confess that I am a sinner. In order to accept the call to accept a robe of righteousness, we have to confess that we are a sinner. We have sinned both against man and God. We repent of that. Then we have to figure out how to become a joint heir with the Messiah, with the Savior. Okay? We have to be buried with Christ in baptism and rise in a newness of life in order to become joint heirs with Jesus. Because that is how we contact that inheritance. Once we do that, then when we come up from the grave, we are then made joint heirs with Him. And then we can put on that robe of righteousness because we are joint heirs with Christ. So I had to say all of this to explain the one verse, who is called and who is chosen. I hope it makes some sense to you because I hate to have people going around not understanding what it is to be a part of Jesus' kingdom. 
It's not complicated that people try to make it. It's very simple. But we have to make a choice. Just like these people had a choice, they could accept the messenger, come to the wedding, come to the wedding. Well, I kind of like to eat. I enjoy festivities. There might be a gift for me there. I, I don't know. Maybe the, you know, maybe they'll pass out some little trinket or a gift. But people who have no spirit within them hate that which is spirit. They hate that which is spirit because spirit and flesh are two separate things. It's only through Christ Jesus that the flesh and the spirit can understand each other. That is the only way it can happen. You'll never understand the spiritual man if you go to psychiatrists and psychologists for the rest of your life. It's not going to happen. We have to put on the spiritual robe of righteousness so that we can answer the call and be chosen by God. Jesus, in His way, His very Jewish way of doing so, was telling not just the evil Pharisees, because there were righteous Pharisees, but the evil Pharisees and the people who are not believers today. He was telling us and them that they are acting evil because their father is evil. And who is their father? Does anybody remember in John where Jesus says something who the father of these evil Pharisees were? The devil. The devil. The father of evil is the devil. And you can either heed his call, hey, don't go to the party! Don't go to the party! Or you can heed God's call, come to the wedding party. That's the choice that we have to make. You have to determine who is your father going to be. That's simple choice. Do you want your father to be the devil and the father of evil and you will become evil? Or do you want your father to be God and righteousness and have the blessings of God in your life? He's not saying you may not have adversity because He's telling us that there are those who do and those who suffer, but they're both righteous. And they will all be at the party. Is there anybody here who needs prayer? Now's the time to ask God because we're righteous and we are do His blessings upon our life because we're called to that part. And we receive the blessings that He has for us. Is there anybody here that needs prayer? I do.